Hello! On this second video of the Human Biology course, we are going to cover the role of enzymes, their contribution to the digestive process, and some illnesses which are either related to enzyme malfunction or illnesses which can be managed through the use of enzymes. So what are these things called enzymes that we hear so much about? Enzymes are proteins whose function is to catalyze reactions or accelerate reactions without participating in them by decreasing the activation energy required for that specific reaction. So looking at this graph, you can see that without the enzymes, the activation energy required would be much higher. After catalyzing the reaction, the enzymes remain unchanged and can be reused in other reactions. An easy way to identify enzymes is by their name. Usually, when you hear about a protein that ends in A's, that means it is an enzyme, such as lactase, which helps break down lactose from dairy products. Enzymes have an active site. This is where the substructs bind to. These active sites are specific, which means each enzyme binds to a specific set of substrates or a group of similar substrates. Enzymes bind with their substrates through two different mechanisms, the lock and key model and the induced fit model. In the induced fit mechanism, the binding site of the enzyme only approximately fits the substrate. When they start to bind, the active site changes its shape to adjust to the substrate shape, turning the substrate into a product. The product then unbinds, leaving the enzyme free to bind to another substrate. In the lock and key mechanism, the substrate binds to the enzyme, forming an enzyme-substrate complex. The substrate can then unbind from the enzyme and remain unchanged, or it can be modified by the enzyme and be converted into a product when it leaves the complex. In the end, the enzyme is free to bind to another substrate again. There are several factors that could affect the rates of the reactions catalyzed by enzymes. The first one is enzyme concentration. The higher the concentration of enzymes, the faster the reaction occurs, so long as there is enough substrate to bind to the enzymes. The second is substrate concentration. The higher the concentration of substrate, the faster the reaction occurs, up until all the enzyme binding sites are occupied, at which point the speed of the reaction stagnates. The third is affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. More specific enzymes will bind faster and therefore speed up the reaction. The fourth is temperature. Higher temperatures increase the rate of the reaction and low temperatures decrease it. However, as mentioned in the previous video, temperatures can cause proteins, and therefore enzymes, to denature and lose their shape and function. Therefore, there is a limit of temperature that enzymes can withstand. Each enzyme has its own preferred temperature range. And the fifth factor is pH. pH is also another factor that could cause protein denaturation, especially when the pH values become extreme, either too alkaline or too acidic. Each enzyme has an optimum pH range. Now let's talk about cofactors and coenzymes. These are ions and molecules such as magnesium, copper, iron and zinc, the minerals that we covered in the last video, and they aid metabolic reactions alongside the enzymes. Cofactors are used in reactions to increase their rate in order for said enzymes to perform their functions more efficiently. They allow the substrate to bind to the active site. See it as the socks to your shoes. You need shoes to be able to walk outside. However, if you don't use socks, you'll get blisters and walk much slower. Well, the enzymes are the shoes, and the cofactors are the socks. Some cofactors can also act as coenzymes. These are molecules which bind to the enzyme and participate directly in the reactions that enzymes catalyze. See it as special anti-blister socks made especially to actively prevent you from getting blisters from uncomfortable shoes. Not only are they performing their original task of protecting your feet, but they were specifically made to prevent the occurrence of blisters. 
Now let's talk about the relationship between enzymes and the way we digest food. Enzymes are intrinsically involved in the digestive process from the moment you start chewing food. When chewing starts, saliva is released into your mouth to help break down your food, but also to deliver chemicals and enzymes to help digest the food. Salivary amylase is the name of the enzyme which is involved at this stage. This enzyme is essential in the breakdown of starch and glycogen, the stored versions of glucose. More enzymes are then released when the food reaches the stomach and again when it reaches the small intestine. These are all different enzymes, but all have the goal of aiding digestion. No enzymes are secreted in the large intestine. Two enzymes are involved in the breakdown of carbohydrates. As you know, complex carbohydrates are called polysaccharides when they have more than 10 molecules. The enzyme amylase turns polysaccharides into disaccharides, which have two molecules, and then other enzymes break down specific disaccharides. The maltase enzyme breaks down maltose, the enzyme sucrase breaks down sucrose, and the enzyme lactase breaks down lactose. This process is so that carbs can be broken down to monosaccharides such as glucose and fructose, as only monosaccharides are absorbed in the intestines. When it comes to fiber, as you may know by now, there is a type of fiber which is not digested and absorbed in our bodies insoluble fiber. This is because it contains cellulose, which is present in the cell walls of plants. Cellulose cannot be broken down in our bodies, as we lack the enzyme required to do so. Therefore, when we ingest insoluble fiber, it simply passes through us without digestion or absorption, and it helps you poo better as well. The breakdown of fats involves enzymes called lipases, which sounds like lipids, so it's easy to remember this one. These lipases convert triglycerides into monoglycerides and free fatty acids, which can then be absorbed. The breakdown of proteins has a few more enzymes in the mix. First, a set of enzymes called endopeptidases break down proteins to peptides, and then another set of enzymes called exopeptidases break down the peptides into amino acids. Some important enzymes involved in the breakdown of proteins are pepsin, trypsin, and chymotrypsin. Now let's look at some diseases and how enzymes are involved in them either as the cause of the diseases or the solution. Lactose intolerance is an extremely common food intolerance. This happens when your body doesn't produce enough of the enzyme lactase, which breaks down lactose, the main sugar present in milk and dairy products. When lactose is not broken down, it cannot be absorbed and is therefore fermented by gut bacteria, leading to flatulence, diarrhea and a number of other symptoms. This can be overcome nowadays by the replacement of dairy products with lactose-free products or dairy-free alternatives. Phenylketonuria is an inherited disease in which the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is mutated and therefore cannot break down the amino acid phenylalanine. This condition can lead to severe side effects such as brain damage, epilepsy and behavioral problems. This condition can be controlled by restricting the intake of foods which contains this amino acid. AATD or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a condition in which the enzyme alpha-1 antitrypsin or AAT for short is not produced in sufficient quantities. When we inhale smoke or toxic materials, not only white blood cells rush to neutralize the threat, but enzymes also act in the lungs to break down the toxic stuff being inhaled. However, these enzymes can also break down healthy lung tissue in the process, so in order to avoid this we have AAT enzymes to protect our lungs. However, in this condition, this enzyme is not present in sufficient amounts, which can lead to lung damage and numerous lung conditions. One treatment that is being investigated is replacement therapy, in which the AAT enzyme is injected directly into the person's bloodstream to balance out the low levels of the enzyme, therefore decreasing the symptoms of the disease. 
there are instances where the levels of certain enzymes in the body can indicate the presence of disease. An example of this is a disease called pancreatitis. In this case, enzymes are not the cause of the disease, but rather the telltale sign that the disease exists. The enzyme lipase mentioned earlier is produced in the pancreas and is used to break down lipids. When there are high concentrations of this enzyme in the blood, as well as another enzyme produced in the pancreas called amylase, it means the pancreas is inflamed, therefore leading to pancreatitis. In certain conditions, the duct that connects the pancreas to the intestines is blocked, therefore blocking the passage of these enzymes to the intestines. This lack of enzymes in the intestines means that some foods are not digested and absorbed, leading to diarrhea and other symptoms. Finally, cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition which leads to damage to the lungs and other organs due to the overproduction of a thick mucus which blocks ducts and passageways. In this condition, the duct which connects the pancreas to the small intestine becomes blocked, therefore preventing digestive enzymes to be released from the pancreas, interfering with the digestive process. A new treatment method called PERT, which is short for Pancreatic Enzyme Replacement Therapy, has been used to mediate this illness. By ingesting pancreatic enzymes, they pass through the digestive system from mouth to stomach and then directly into the intestines, where they can be used for digestion. This way, they bypass the blocked pancreatic duct and go directly to the intestines. Patients with this condition have to ingest these enzymes before every meal in order to allow digestion to take place. And that is it for today. I hope you have enjoyed this video. You can check out the whole course on our Patreon. See you next time!